Thank you. Uh, we'd like to, to uh, tell you a bit about the history of this conference. Uh, it's been ongoing for 20 years, and uh, uh, to my left, I have Olivia Holmes, who was one of the organizers of the first conference in Kent, 1997. And uh, I'm Peter Linde. I'm, uh, I, I was there at the, as a delegate uh, at the first conference. Um, I'm a librarian at the Breaking Institute of Technology, Sweden. We have Sally Costa, uh, who um, also participated in the, the 1999 and, uh, and uh, been with the conference since then. Jean-Claude, who, as me, uh, visited the first conference, and, uh, and we have uh, Leslie Chan, who also uh, uh, is an early l -pubber. So uh, we'll start with Olivia uh, telling you a bit about why this conference came about. Is it okay? Can you hear all right? Um, right. Well, as, as Peter said, the first LPUB conference was held at the University of Kent in Canterbury, and the theme was New Models and Opportunities. So I'd like to share with you the story a bit of how we arrived at that day. And we have a theme, which is the night sky, which provided the backdrop to some of the important events leading up to the conference. Um, almost two years before, in July 1995, a new comet was discovered, observed by two amateur astronomers, Alan Hale and Thomas Bock, near their homes in New Mexico and Arizona. John Smith, science and technology librarian at the University of Kent and local organiser of the first conference, shared their enthusiasm for astronomy, often watching the stars from his garden to the north of Canterbury. Preparations for the conference were intensive during the final days of March 1997, when Comet Halebot was at its closest to the Earth and clearly visible to the naked eye. We often worked long after the library had closed, and apart from the light in John's office, the building was shrouded in darkness. Driving home one night through the woods, north of Canterbury, we looked up at the sky, and there was the comet, shining so brightly and really beautiful. A comet sign of momentous change since ancient times was passing over our new conference. It was really special and it's something John and I still talk about quite often now. Um, there were two prestigious organisations and a small group of individuals who were responsible for the creation of the conference. First was the International Council for Computer Communications, IEEC, and the second, the International Federation for Information Processing, IFIP. The idea of a conference on electronic publishing was first discussed at IFIP and a joint conference with IEEC suggested by Professor Dipak Pakar of the University of Lund, who was treasurer of IFIP and a member of the executive committee of IEEC. <coughs> IEEC was a non-profit co corporation set up in 1972 and an affiliate member of IFIP. Members were known as governors and their numbers limited to just 125. They came from all fields of computer communications and included distinguished scientists, technologists, economists and government officials. IFIP is the leading multinational apolitical organisation in information and communications technologies and sciences. It is recognised by the United Nations and has a consultative role in UNESCO. It represents IT societies from 56 countries or regions across the world and sponsors 100 conferences a year. So I think we can say that our conference has a very distinguished parentage in these two, in these two organisations and in international communication. In 1996, a Comnet workshop was organised by Dr Ramani of IEEC at his college in Mumbai. Comnet was a conference series similar to LPUB and Dr. Ramani was the organiser in India. After the workshop, a party was held on the roof terrace of Dr. Ramani's house and it was here that he introduced Professor Kaka and Dr. Michael Miller, also of IEEC, to John Smith. 
Michael was an expert in digital communications and John was interested in the growing use of networks and computing in academic communications. Already the conference had an international flavour and the night sky was providing the backdrop. Apparently it was a lovely party. A series of meetings were held and the idea became a reality. Professor Jack Meadows from Loughborough University, where both Dipak and John had studied, um, was invited to head the programme committee and they were joined by, oops, sorry, by Fitt and Rowland, also from Loughborough. The team was now complete and all for papers went out and the first electronic publishing conference was underway. Now we must return to the beginning and the garden. As registration started to come in, we put a map on the wall in John's office in the library and marked with pins the home countries of all our delegates. When we were in the garden watching the stars, we often saw planes flying out from London and wondered about the people on board and the countries they were heading for. Would some of those planes now be carrying our delegates on their return flights? By the eve of the conference, we had 130 pins in 28 countries. Soon we would see the faces of all the names on our list and we imagined everyone packing their cases and heading for stations and airports to travel to Canterbury. Apart from the comet, this is actually our favourite memory, that thought before the conference. Would they really come? Would it be a success? They did, it was. And so now I would like to introduce you, as Peter already has, to Peter and Jean-Claude, um, to ask you both if you could share with us what drew you to this new conference, what topics were most interesting at the time, and when you returned to the airport to fly home, what new ideas you took with you. So, ladies and gentlemen, please move on. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I, in, the, in 1995, I, I started a new job at the Blakey Institute of Technology, and after uh, some time, I realized we, we needed a, a, a repository of some sort to, to you know, keep, to, to know what was produced by the scientists at the Institute, because there, there, nobody knew, uh, had any record of, of what was produced, really. Um, but I, uh, I wasn't really clear of, uh, how this was going to uh, be realized. So uh, by chance, I, I saw this ad in a, in a, in a library journal about a conference on electronic publishing. So that, that might be just perfect. So, uh, so I, I was able to get the funds and I took the plane to, to, uh, to, uh, to London and uh, the train up to, to Kent. And this was my first conference ever, so I, I wasn't really sure what to expect. Uh, uh, what I found out was that uh, uh, I didn't get any exact uh, instructions how to con construct a, a, a repository, but, but I got inspiration that it was possible. I, I also got kind of a, a network of people uh, that uh, had uh, the same idea and the same uh, the same. There was a lot of librarians there. Actually, it was a mix of librarians and 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 uh, scientists, and that mix was really nice. Uh, and I remember when I was thinking uh, yesterday when we saw. We, uh, I, I heard a discussion on uh, peer review, uh, this idea about um, that we don't need publishers anymore because of the net and the commu new communications. We, there, there also was a panel uh, in, in Kent 1997 uh, uh, where, where uh, publishers and scientists were debating uh, uh, new ways of, of uh, uh, the new um, scientific journal, how would it look like? And <laughs> the, the, uh, the arguments were there, already there, that, that uh, <coughs> we don't need the publishers anymore. And, and, you know, 20 years on, we still have the same uh, uh, debate, really, but uh, nobody's really doing anything about it. But <laughs> 
but uh, so so the questions are are, are still uh, quite the same, I think. Um, and but what I brought back with me was was a sense of uh, a new uh, family, more or less, uh, 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 because the the spirit of the conference was was. Uh, I don't know, it, it, it got to me that, that uh, nothing is really impossible. You, you can do it. It's, it's, uh, so uh, that's my, my, my memories of, of, of this conference. Thank you. Well, um, I think it's my Alzheimer, but um, uh, in some ways I don't quite remember how I got involved with the conference and how I got there. Uh, being of Norman extraction in France, although I live in Canada, as you know, um, I was delighted getting into Canterbury to see how Norman this place looked. So that was the first form of reassurance for me. And the second thing is that I was kept on wondering why, why the British had suddenly decided to use the, uh, the article, the Spanish article L to describe their pubs. El pub, and I, I, I kept on. But I must say, the pub played a very important role in that uh, in that uh, uh, meeting. In fact, that may explain why I remember so little of it. It's, uh, it may have been one of the reasons for that. But let's go back to this period, 96, 90, 97. My own interests at the time were quite different from the, those that, uh, let's say, impel me nowadays. Uh, on the one hand, I was getting very involved with the Internet Society and was prepared, had just gone through the INET meeting, which was the worldwide meeting of 96 in Montreal, in fact, as one of the, the, the co-chair of the program committee. And at that time, I was a little known for a, an electronic journal in Canada, which dealt with uh, literature. Now imagine in 96 asking a literature professor to access articles uh, on the FTP site. And the web was barely emerging and I think Mosaic was just one of the first browsers available at the time and we had not moved yet to, uh, to uh, the HTTP kind of, of, of protocol. And because we were doing a journal in French and in English and in German, in fact, we published some articles in German as well, uh, the, um, we needed diacriticals and that meant we had to encode our texts into plain ASCII because at the time only 7-bit ASCII was available. So the poor literature professor that I'm referring to had to learn Unix commands, had, had to learn how to, learn how to download the file, how to extract it from its encoding, and then to unzip it, on, to un bin exit if you use the Macintosh, and so on and so forth. In short, it was you know a sort of work which obviously gave you paradise if you managed to read that particular article. So we kept on publishing for unknown readers. And we were practicing open access without naming it. Uh, we were just doing that because if we had made people pay for the journals on top of that, then we would have been sure of the disastrous results we were facing. But we kept on going and we finally did that for 10 years. You must remember that at the time, the, the pushbacks you were getting from people were really quite funny seen from our perspective. So things have remained the same, but some questions have definitely changed. Um, I remember discussions with university press people in Canada saying to me, of course you can, ex you can dispense with printing and storing and shipping by mail, and that's expensive, but do you know the cost of a hard disk? Do you know the cost of a hard disk? How are you going to finance that hard disk? You know? And of course, yes, at the time, a hard disk was very, very expensive, and people were not factoring in the the, the kind of, of logic of decreasing prices that we've seen in, in computer science since then. So we were facing a number of issues which were, from our perspective now, uh, were, look quite, quite strange, and yet at the same time they instruct us about something. Whenever we are at some stage of transformation of something like, let's say, publishing, but that could go for any technology, Whenever you are in that sort of situation, people are going to start from where they are. They're not going to see some end point and then try to chart the fastest 
path to that, they are going to see where they are and they are going to see how difficult it is for them to move away from that. And all the difficulties are going to be piling up and piling up and piling up. In my main memory of that meeting in 97 in Canterbury was really a long series of discussions. How can we depart from where we are? How can we really do it? How can we really move forward? And what can we do? And of course, in 96, 97, we were all in a sort of paper-oriented uh, vision of things. We still are in many ways. Uh, that's going to be a long time. As you know, Gregory Crane has defined our period as the period of digital incunabula. And indeed, at that period, we were really entering that period of digital in, in, in Nabula. Uh, it took 50 years for the print world to move beyond the manuscripts. It may well take us 50 years to get out of the print world. And I think that's what we we're beginning to experience that. This said, 97, I discovered some of the best English beers, and they were really quite good. I discovered a lot of really good and friendly people. Um, Meadows and Fitt and Roland have remained big names in, the, in this uh, sort of field of discussion. At the time, we were all young and beautiful. Nowadays, we're only beautiful. Um, so we have to live with that. But, uh, <laughs> but, and, and, uh, and yet, we're continuing with a, a dream, which is perhaps the most important one, which I'll talk to you about tomorrow, which is uh, Researchers need to communicate and to talk to each other and work together. And how can we build the best communication system for all of us who are interested in knowledge and research? And that's, I think we did a very good beginning at that meeting in 97. Thank you. Right. Um, at the first conference, um, <clears throat> a group of about um, 20 delegates from Central and Eastern Europe traveled to Canterbury under the auspices of the Electronic Publishing Development Program of the Open Society Institute, OSI, based in Budapest and led by Michael Kay. The OSI is part of the Open Society Foundation, founded by George Soros in 1979 to encourage the replacement of authoritarian governments with open and democratic societies. The involvement of OSI enriched the early years of the conference enormously broadening the diversity of countries represented and the range of challenges faced. <coughs> Attending as delegates in Canterbury, many were then speakers in the second and third years in Budapest and Sweden. Their papers describe the terrible events taking place in their countries and are still powerful and moving to read today. And if you really read them, because they are just brilliant. They really, they move me. In, in Sweden, Kemal Bakashik spoke, spoke of the struggle to rebuild in Bosnia after the near obliteration of book production and the killing of memory through the deliberate destruction of libraries. Zoran Gligorov wrote his paper as NATO troops were entering Macedonia. He described the difference in the ways the elderly and the young recovered from totalitarianism and how it was easier for the young in countries in transition to access democracy through the internet and become digital citizens. The final event on the programme is the handover. People wishing to host the conference in their home countries are required to be involved on the programme committee at the conference the year before. This idea came out of the first conference and has generated a strong sense of continuity within the organising and programme committees. Um, so, um, to finish, um, my hope is that around the world, people will continue to stand in their gardens, searching the sky for comets and stars, and planes, carrying delegates, future conferences, meet and exchange ideas. So I'd like to hand over to another delegate who arrived on the plane, Sally. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to apologize because I am feeling really terribly bad. I think I've got hay fever since yesterday. I have problems in my eyes, in my nose, in my throat, my headaches. <laughs> and I feel I'm feeling really terrible. <clears throat> I'm going to try to say something because I can't see properly. Uh, we have some slides. Uh, first of all, uh, I also would, say, would like to say that I went to 
Sweden in 1999. And there, I met two Portuguese guys who are, who are looking for, there is a Brazilian here, you have to meet her. And then they, 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 they came to me, they introduced themselves, and we have had, since 1999, a very good partnership in projects and a number of activities. And Anna Lisi from University of Minho and myself, we dig into the Elpub Digital Library and we have an, anali an, an, an analysis of the abstracts that are available there. And you extracted data on countries, authors, and subjects and started doing some playing with the data. We produced a lot of uh, pictures, but because of the time, we decided to show you just a little bit of them, and we are going to write an article that's going to be published in the future, because we really found interesting to play with the data from the Airbus Digital Library. <clears throat> Well, me and Les selected, I think, three or four pictures. This one is on the occurrence of papers by year. How many publications we have uh, from El Pub proceedings since 1997 and 1999. And you see there are periods where we, when you have uh, a number of, of papers. There are periods when you have very few papers and only um, maybe the context can explain to us why uh, a very small number of papers at different times. In 1999, we had uh, Sweden, then in 2000, Kaliningrad, 2001, back to Kent, 2002 Czech Republic, 2003 Portugal, 2004 Brazil, 2006 Belgium, right? 2005 Belgium, 2006 Bulgaria, right? Yes. 2007, don't remember? <laughs> Do you remember, Peter? Vienna, yes, Austria. 2008, Toronto, in Canada. 2009, Helsinki, in Finland, yes. 2010, who could help me? <laughs> oh, can't remember 2010. Then I, I got sick and I stopped going to the conference until I think 2014. I think 2014, it was in Turkey, no, not Turkey, Greece. 2013, Turkey. And with, we, we, we don't remember 2012, 2011. 2010, I think, uh, Turkey, uh, 2012. <laughs> 2012, Thessaloniki. Uh, 13 was in Sweden again, uh, 14, uh, I mixed it up. Anyway, doesn't matter. Yeah. The, the, the idea is to show you how uh, different places have been hold, holding El Pub. And I think the only, the only conference outside Europe was in Canada and Brazil. Yes, and it has, it, El Pub has influenced my professional activities. Every, everything that I saw uh, during the conference, I tried to take it back to Brazil and do something there. <clears throat> uh, the, the most, the most, uh, yeah. The greater number of papers was in 2007. Uh, the next slide is on top countries participation, but it's only regard the authors. 
because a public digital library do not have data on delegates. So the most participant country is the UK, the only conference that didn't have anyone, anyone from UK was the Brazilian one. Oh my goodness. Yes, it's too far, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yes, and then the second most participant country is Germany. Then we have the USA and Portugal with the same percentage. Then Brazil, then Sweden and Austria, and then Italy. These are the most part participative countries in terms of authors, not delegates. Next. Is it? Okay. This is the picture that shows, uh, again, the most participative countries. And you can see that Germany participated in every conference last 1998. Uh, where is UK there? It, I think it's, we couldn't, we couldn't bring it here, but it's below Slovenia, UK. Yeah, UK only part, don't, didn't participate in Brazil, Portugal, etc. Next. Yes, it's the, the top, top subject in your pub. And this, this picture is self-explaining. You see that very obviously, electronic publishing is the, is the top topic. Only in 2003, nobody talked about electronic publishing. Then you have repositories, open access, standards, digital libraries, and things like that. Uh, we have much more, of course, subject, but these are the top ones. Uh, what's this? I can't see. I can't read. <laughs> it's the, I think it's the nine top topics, isn't it? Which, which is the most discussed top? I think it is electronic publishing at yeah, this orange one. Okay, just a, another picture about the same data. And that, that's all, Leslie. Now it's with you. I think this, this picture. Is on you. So, as I said, I have a richness of data in a digital library that we are going to exploit later on in an article. And we are going to have enough time to discuss with anyone who, who wants to, to help us with the analysis. Thank you very much. Is it now? Well, thank you uh, uh, for the opportunity to talk a little bit about the my involvement uh, with the conference, but I was given an assignment because, as you know, the session title is about past, present, and future. So the assignment that was given to me was to make some references to the future. Uh, and we know how easy it is to make predictions about the future, so this is going to be a very short uh, predictions. Uh, but Given the, given the challenge of predictions, I thought I would make a number of pleas instead. So it is, I, I would like to make a small wish list of what I would like to see in future LPUB conferences, uh, assuming that LPUB will continue to uh, grow, as I, I'm confident it will. Now, speaking about LPUB uh, conferences, we haven't quite mentioned uh, the rather sort of loose and organic nature of how these conferences are organized from year to year, or you, even though we have certainly a distinct tradition, that is, uh, in order to be hosting a conference, uh, this year you have to be involved with the program committee, uh, the year before, uh, and uh, so, so on and on. So if you want to host a conference um, next year, as uh, Fernando is doing, uh, next year hosting in Cyprus, he's been involved with the conference programming for this year. So if you want to be involved in 2018, speak to Fernando, uh, and then you could be uh, involved uh, further down, we'll pass a baton on to you, so to speak. And the theme of um, uh, the yearly conferences are really determined uh, by a group, uh, the executive committees and all the programming people just decide on sort of the major themes uh, for the year, and I'm, I'm glad that the themes that was chosen for this year is focusing on power, agencies, and um, 
agenda setting. And so and I'm, I'm glad to see the word power uh, incorporated into uh, the theme and there will be discussion throughout the next couple of days uh, on that notion of power. And I think by looking at some of those historical participants uh, uh, of LPOP, uh, I, I mean, it's easy to conclude that this is a conference series that is primarily uh, Europe-based conference uh, and for good historical reason. And so a lot of the concerns that were discussed over the years in the conference series uh, have largely been focused uh, on Europe and to some extent uh, North America. And, and so the focus has been fairly, uh, um, in my view, fairly focused from the power structures uh, of the global north. That is how agendas being set by the existing publishing power and the scientific establishment uh, in Europe and in North America. And uh, the original reason in 2001 when I first got involved with the LPOP conference series was because uh, by that time we were running a small operation of, again, what later came to be known as Open Access, a platform that my Brazilian colleague and I started in the early 90s uh, to provide open access to journals from the developing world. Uh, and again, we started with emails, gopher, and, and, and very simple uh, FTPs and so forth. And then when the web came about, we transferred material over to the web and started experimenting with what later came to be known as open access. So by 2001, we had some lessons and experience to share when we were looking for a venue to talk about the experience we had. And I was searching for places to present and I came across this conference called LPOP, and it, the tagline at the time in 2001 was connecting the East and the West. I don't know if you remember that. And that has to do with what Olivia referred to earlier because of OSI's, uh, uh, Soros Foundation's uh, support uh, for the first few years of uh, providing funding for um, scholars from Eastern Europe to travel to Western Europe to exchange so that, uh, so that there would be greater access to knowledge on, on uh, across the then east so-called eastern and western europe and so at the time i wasn't paying close enough attention to the east and the west i assume it was about the east meaning the global east and and the west so i thought oh good this is a global conference i'll i'll present something about uh, international collaboration it should be the right venue so only when i got there that i found out it was about eastern europe and western europe but as it were it was good. It was it was it was a it was one of the few venue where we actually been really exploring these kind of issues, and I was very pleased that so many of the, the colleagues that I met there, including Sally, that I met there for the first time, uh, remain close co contacts, friends, collaborators uh, that continue to to discuss and debate and support a lot of these issues that we're interested in exploring collectively. That is, how could the internet begin to redress the imbalance in the power between those countries and those uh, institutions that have lots uh, and those who have none. And so I'm also glad that Norbert in his introductory remark mentioned the importance of balance, a balance of the needs of the different players. And I was also pleased, as I was saying, I have three plea uh, wish lists uh, about the future of LPOP. And that is to continue to address the issue of balance balancing the needs of not only different institutional players within, but between institution uh, and between countries. I think from working with many of my colleagues who are working in the repositories and so forth, uh, I'm beginning to sense that we're becoming uh, our own uh, silos in many ways. Institutional repository have become uh, a thing unto itself. And I know there are lots of efforts to federate uh, and connect and share services uh, my own frustration with my own institution is that uh, a lot of those services are really not scaled up. And so a lot of the things remain localized uh, and, and get stuck. So they're not really serving the needs of scholars, uh, both locally and globally. So my plea is that going forward in future LPUPs, uh, we will see more of the actual uh, way of solving some of these problems. My second plea is about representation. And again, uh, as Sally Sly shown, uh, 
a lot of those top uh, participants and, uh, and topics and so forth, again, are concentrated on, cert on certain areas. A lot of, uh, I work with many colleagues from uh, various so-called developing countries, and I would say if we were to do a, cl a cloud map of what they're interested in, uh, we would see a very different ground ma uh, map of the, the kind of issues and so forth. And so, uh, and we're talking about still three quarters of humanity and the rest of the, of the world. So we have to understand what the needs of many of these scholars uh, uh, and students and citizens have in terms of their uh, scholarly needs. Uh, and so that please about representation. So, I, and I was struck yesterday when I uh, uh, attended the uh, open peer review workshop uh, and one of the goal of the workshop, I was reminded, was to come to some common understanding of vocabulary. Uh, even the term control vocabulary was used, metadata, and so forth. So there was a sense that if we want to come to understand open peer review, we have to come to some community technical standard about what constitutes uh, open peer review so we can code them, so we can let machine read them, so we can be able to filter out what is and what isn't, quote, peer review and so forth. Uh, two things stood out, so this is a very technocratic approach to understanding uh, community dynamics. And number two is that who it is that get to set these standard and agenda for the rest of the world, uh, given that this is something that is not open to easily to many, many participants who could easily have input to this kind of thing. So my plea for future and going forward is to ensure that we have better representation of players and needs from other parts of the world so that these kind of conversation would take into account uh, their particular set of concerns and so forth. Um, I think that I have other wishes, but I'm, I'm going to hold it to myself. Uh, uh, but again, I want to uh, express my appreciation of uh, many of my colleagues and uh, all those people I've met over the years through the uh, conference series have learned a great deal from the many, 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 many different perspectives, many, many different um, innovations uh, across the world. Uh, and it, it, this is a great venue to be able to have uh, open debates about them. So look forward to interacting with all of you over the next few days. Oh, thank you.